welcome to the podcast, Thank Ben. You. So I'm going to basically start off with your introduction, or you tell me your introduction as golf coach, life, yeah, everything about you, basically. Okay. So I started playing golf. Well, right now I'm the head coach at iGolf Studio in Sheffield. Um, I still play a little bit in locally in the region. I used to play full time um, on the European Tour, the Challenge Tour. Um, did okay. Got to I think 250th in the world was my highest world ranking, which is pretty good. good. Yeah. Um, I finished doing that in 2010, and I've been coaching ever since. Um, and obviously, here in iGolf Studio, I've got. I use quite a lot of technology in my coaching. Um, use the flight scope, body track, um, some three D things like hat motion and things like that. Um, but when did it all start for me? I was, I started playing when I was about twelve years old ish, mm. 12, 13 years old. Um, with a cut down set of golf clubs, my dad's. In fact, I don't, I'm not even sure they were cut down. It's not good. Mm. It? Should have been. Should have been. But at least they are these days. Um, and just fell in love with it straight away. I love the idea of it just being all about you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all on you. Yeah. There's, no, there's nowhere to hide with it. You can't blame teammates like you could in football or any other rugby or the sports that I played. Um, I love the solitude of practice. You know, yeah. where I, I love doing that as a kid, just going, I'd, I'd be hitting balls until dark. Until dark, until yeah. Dark. yeah. But just as a kid, I just loved it. Um, I left school at 16 and decided to play golf full time. That was when you were allowed to leave school at 16 and like, pursue your life that mm -hmm. you wanted to do. And uh, I played, I progressively got better at that point and eventually represented England as an amateur. Nearly made the World Cup team and uh, turned pro in October 99, so 20 years ago. 20 years. Gosh. <laughs> God. 20 years ago <laughs> turned pro 20 years ago and went to the Q school and, and it all went from there really yeah brilliant uh, yeah you often, you say you nearly made the Walker Cup yeah and then you were just talking before this and you were saying a lot of the players you were around in that generation which have gone on to be yeah. multiple tour winners and etc do you think you was in a, a tough school generation if you will or? yeah I mean my, my generation there was Luke Donald Paul Casey um, who else played in that team? Ken, uh, Graham Storm played in that team. Gary Wilson Owen played in that team. Then there was there was three Scottish lads. Um, the Graham Rankin, who was a great amateur at the time, um, and Lorne Kelly. Um, a lad called Philip Rowe from England. There was, there was it was it was, a, it was a tough school to get in. Mm -hmm. but it was a tough walk to put team. Do you think that made you potentially better as a result? Possibly, possibly. You knew you you knew you you know it wasn't a case of start of the year knowing your place was confirmed in the mm. side so you had to play well to get into, into the team um, and yeah and competition is good isn't it yeah the, nice. the more competitive you are and the more people you have to compete against the better you get yeah yeah definitely it's interesting I mean um, I was talking to an, a current England player the other day who's a client of mine and he was saying how last season he was having a terrible year because there was a lot of pressure on him to perform. Mm -hmm. Then he got to a point where his results were kind of borderline bad enough where he probably knew he wouldn't be probably in the squads the following year. And as soon as he came to accept that, had great results to finish mm -hmm. off the season. Do you think there's an element of sometimes now in golf, there's almost too much pressure from when you get to a certain amateur level? Possibly in amateur golf, yeah. I mean, it, I suppose in amateur golf, if you want to pay for it, play for a team, you are selected. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the difference in professional golf, your performance is based on you, not an opinion of you. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can play great as an amateur and not get picked. It doesn't happen because there are order of merits and things yeah. like that. Yeah. But it, it could happen that way. So you feel pressure when people are watching you. Um, I suppose, whereas a professional, the only pressure that's out there is the pressure you put on yourself. Yeah, yeah. There, there is an amount. If you want to play for a team, it's the pressure you're putting on yourself. But I suppose it does feel there's a little bit more external pressure yeah. when you are having to maybe impress somebody to get selected. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in professional golf, that's not there. I suppose the only time it is there is if you're in the Ryder Cup team and you want the wild card for the Ryder Cup. Um, but more. 
professional golf compared to amateur golf, I'd say that it's a different type of pressure. Yeah. In that sort of sense. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting because obviously we first came across, I was thinking about this on route, we first came across one another and we had a, a common client. Yep. Um, and I know we had a chat and the bit of the background was that individual was suffering with a serious back problem. We kind of communicated more as a result because your principle as a coach was almost in question of whether it was anything mechanically in his swing that might have been causing it or caused it initially, which from my perspective as a physical coach, I found that quite refreshing to hear personally because there's a lot of there's a lot of technical coaches out there who either really dismiss the physical side or only look at it as um, what I almost will just call like generic fitness. Like mm-hmm. you're a, you're a golfer, let's just do some fitness because we know it should be done as opposed to what impact that has on the, the player. Um, so within that with that kind of point in mind, what would you say your philosophy is as a, a golf coach in general? I would say my philosophy as a coach in general, not necessarily a golf coach, a coach in general, is you should be exercising for the sport you play. So I personally wouldn't go play football because I don't train to be a footballer. Yeah, yeah. I think you're more than likely going to get injured <clears throat> if you are not training for the sport that you play. So I've, I've had a lot of friends who, you know, someone says, oh, should we have a game of five aside this weekend? And they go and they do the crucial ligament. I've seen it happen quite a few times to a few friends who are golfers and go play a game of football. They've not been training as a footballer would do and they get injured. Um, and the same applies to golf. If if you want to play golf, certainly at a high level, um, for me, you need to have, your body needs to understand how you want it to work. And to do that is through training it to know that's what, what, it, what it needs to do. Yeah. That it needs to be strong enough in the areas you need to be strong enough. Um, and every sport is different. I think, yes, generic fitness is great, and for anybody, <laughs> generic fitness is a good thing, but if you specifically want to be a golfer, you need to, I think it needs to be more specific to the sport that you play. Yeah, yeah. How's, how do you think it's changed for you, Gossie, since you were 20 years ago, you say you said pro, which isn't long, but no. yet it feels a long time in sort of how golf is, evolved in recent years. I suppose from when I started playing, and so I first went out traveling, traveling playing as a professional golfer in 2000, 2001. The, this is the best way I can put it, when I, and then went to I finished playing in 2010. In 2000, the queue for the bar was bigger than the queue for the gym. Sounds good. So, <laughs> you know, you, you couldn't get in the bar to get a drink on a Tuesday night, and now you can't get in the gym to train. Yeah. That was the difference, yeah, and you yeah. know, so I suppose the generation change during that time. I would say that's when it really came about because we saw Tiger Woods doing it and VJ Singh. I think they were the pioneers of Gary Player, obviously, back in his day. But he was he probably the only one doing it? No, I think to be honest, when you look through time, you know, Faldo did it, Norman did it. Amazingly, how it's always the best golfers. Yes, yeah. that is that a coincidence? Yeah, I personally don't think so. No, go the extra but, mile and yeah. What what, are, what is everybody doing differently to get an edge? Yeah, um, Faldo saw fitness as something. Norman saw fitness as a way to get an edge on everyone else. Tiger upped it mm-hmm. from where they were doing it. He was probably the first one who came along with lifting. Yeah, um, and we saw. I mean, well, the proofs there with Tiger Woods, isn't it? Yeah. And then the generation coming through has seen Tiger Woods do that, and it's changing because of that. Changing, yeah. The Tiger Woods effect. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I think kind of that leads me onto this perfectly. It's like I look around your studio and you've got every piece of equipment you can probably pretty much ask for <laughs> from a golf coaching, yeah, sort yeah. of modern golf coaching, if you will. Um, yeah, I know you use that equipment in a way that. I wouldn't class you as a, um, how's the best way of putting it, like a scientist coach who's just geeky and just works with numbers and can't get the message across. So how do you kind of make this all interlinked to get that best results, really? I th- well, I think first the technology in coaching is fantastic, but you've got to be very, very careful with it. Um, you can't just teach using the technology. I think, for me, the technology tells you where to look for the answers. 
um, and you get there quicker because of it. You can't just teach using it. You can't just have a, a fly scrub or a track man there and, oh, look, your, your club path is too far to the right, let's move it to the left. It doesn't kind of work like that. And you go, right, the, club, the, the guy, the golfer hits big hooks because his club path is too far to the right and the face is closed. Do we need technology to know that? Possibly not. Um, but then it's how we affect change. And affecting change is then back on the coaching. So the technology is there, it's great. So the technology will show you why something is happening. You've then got to change it. And then you, the technology then proves if the change was a, a correct change or not. Yeah. Um, so it's really, really important. But I always say to people, the best piece of technology in the room is still the coach. Very still good. the coach. Yeah. You know, you can have all the technology in the world, but if they're not using it correctly, or if they're just using them in the, the flight scope, the track man doesn't change goal swings. It just tells you what's happened. Do you, do you think there's a, there's a golf coach out there, and I mean that kind of broadly, who is that type of coach? Pass. Pass. Not um, something you've come up Not with. something, I mean, probably. Um, but I'd like to think that most people within the golf industry um, are studying a lot more than they used to do. Um, there's so much um, information out on social media nowadays that if you're understanding, if you're not yeah. understanding, you're not studying properly. You're, you're not, you're not learning. You're closed. Yeah. You've very got yeah. a very closed mindset, and this is the way you do it. So, do you? Because obviously, they say 100 percent the golf coach is the most important. Is there a piece of technology that you? I don't, it doesn't matter if that's new or old, but that you almost like a you, a go to piece that gives you that piece of information that I always always have flight scope running. Yeah, always. Um, personally, because I'm indoors, so I've got to. So I've, I've got a ball flight to actually watch. I, the, the, the flight scope gives me my ball flight. But I think a lot of the time, the the things that the numbers that the the launch monitor gives out is important to see. That's the DNA. It gives you the golfer's DNA of golf swing. Other things I'll throw in there depending on what's happening. Like the, I think body track I use virtually in every session. I like to see how the golfer's interacting with the ground. And then possibly the, I'll use the wrist sensor a little bit more, the hand motion wrist sensor as well. But they're, they're the main three main ones I use, and plus the videos running as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think video's still important, less important than what it was because we're not as coaching's moved on, you'll see on the PGA Tour, the European Tour now, we've seen a lot more different golf swings. Mm -hmm. And it's all results-based. What is what do, what result does a golf swing produce? And can you produce it consistently rather than it looking good? Yes. Yeah, which okay. is, um, which I think that's where a lot of the, kind of my side, the physical side, has a big impact on how those two things interlink. Absolutely. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. I think that then goes to that the hack motion, the wrist sensor. Because mm. I, I saw a video recently you put up, or someone shared it, I think it was. And I'm not even sure if you're aware of it, but they shared it on a uh, golf biomechanics group. Okay. Um, about how you change the wrist angle that then impacted. I can't remember exactly what it impacted. Yeah, I think it was. Um, it, we changed the ground, the, the the pressure trace within the ground. So the pressure trace is how the the golfer moves pressure through the ground. And we, I remember the golfer was moving the pressure from the, the right heel and in the downswing moving towards the left toe. And it, the, the, the club face looked like it was open. So I put the sensor on there to, to see what the, how the wrist was performing. And we got the, the, club, the wrist a little bit more flexed or, or bowed. And it, the, the golfer changed how he moved on the ground. Brilliant. That's the, from, I would say that's a, a really advanced way of, of looking and picking apart a movement and not going, looking at it in isolation, looking at how that kind of everything interlinks within the body. Absolutely. I think I think with golf, what well, you've got to be careful with the golf coaching, you change something, it changes something else. Yeah. Golfers have learned to hit a golf ball a certain way. So whenever you change something, something else either changes or has to change, otherwise they won't make contact. Uh, because they've, it's almost like two wrongs making a right. You know, that they may have a golf swing with a, a tendency to do something and then they will do something else to match up the tendency to hit a good, to get the ball started on that. Yeah. That I think that's um I think that a lot of that links into a lot of biomechanical principles, would you say? 
I, I don't know. Does that is that something? Because well, I, I, from one thing I've noticed is a lot of golf coaches, they know loads about the golf swing, mm -hmm. and they know it in the golf swing terminology, but what they're actually seeing is almost basic, well not basic, but biomechanical principles that relates to all sporting movement. Yet they don't always understand how that is a normal thing. If that makes sense, so. Absolutely, I mean, it's cause and effect, isn't it? Yeah. How do we walk? Well, we have to lose balance forward and then the foot goes out in front to do it. And it's, it's all all reaction. You know, how do we react to, to something we do? If we if someone pushes us over biomechanically, we will can, can yeah. try and yeah. counterbalance ourselves. And I think that with the golf swing, it's exactly the same. If you've got the club face in a certain position at a certain time, you're going to kind of try and react to, to change how that is. And it's all... <laughs> It's all based around that, you know. It's, it's create golf swings creating a matchup. Yeah, you know and how things match up together. Like you say, biomechanically, um, and whether the golfer can do it. <laughs> That's the big one, isn't it? You know, m most coaches don't teach elite golfers who have the who spent two or three years with people like yourself mm -hmm. and the body work perfectly. Mm -hmm. Most of us teach golfers with bad hips, yeah, dodgy shoulders. Um, who won't do any strength and conditioning? Um, some will, but you know, this is me. Make me better without me practicing as well. And you've got to then work out how that golfer has to improve because of their biomechanical makeup. Yes, that's a really good point. And I think that the kind of that links into you know, I think there's a, a huge viewpoint out there where golf strength conditioning is often seen as only for better players or elite players. Um, and I'm quite fortunate enough where where I work with a vast range of ages and abilities. And surprisingly, the what I would class is maybe the older population who they get to a certain age where they almost seemingly overnight, obviously it happens over a long period of time, but seemingly overnight, they just drop 50 yards off the tip and yeah. they go, I can't, like my short game's still good, I'm mentally still sharp, I'm course manager, whatever it may be, but I just can't reach par fours and two anymore, for example. Um, and that's when, I guess, a technical element becomes redundant because it's very much about the physical side. Absolutely, yeah, you, 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 you're limited, aren't you? I, I don't know what the age is, but um, I think I saw something the other day, it's quite low, where we actually would all get slower. Mm -hmm. Or golf swing wise, your golf swing reaches a peak at a certain age and will get slower unless you do something about yeah. it. Um, so, yeah, when you when you say is it for is it just for the better players? Well, it has to be for the better players. If they want to be better, they have to do it. In my opinion, there's no getting away from that fact. Um, for the average golfer, it depends on the goals. Like you say, if they've got a they've found that they, they, they've dropped thirty yards and they want to get that back. Well, they've, they've got to do something about it. Um, technology can help, technique can help, but generally, yeah, they're just not as strong as they are as they were. We, yeah. We, I don't. Again, I don't know what age it is, but we will lose muscle mass as we get older. We'll get weaker. We both our bones get frailer. Yeah. So you've got to make up for that somewhere along the line, and whether it's you know going to the gym and lifting some weights to get stronger or being able to move mm -hmm. better. It's it's interesting then because it, it's almost. We said we were speaking before, and you was talking about how you think you can see how potentially golf careers moving forward are going to be a lot shorter than they have been in the past. Of, I mean, we see people like Phil Mickelson, who's mm -hmm. still one of the best players in the world, and near, near enough on the um, seniors tour, isn't he? Why? So, what? Just explain why you think that. I just think it, the, the, the golf swing become more explosive. So, for the reasons we just discussed. Golfers may get slower and can't compete for as long um, because the club head speed now and the, the ball speed that they get these guys are creating, can they sustain that up into the mid-40s? Um, and also as well, the, can the body sustain the movements they're making these days? You look at some of these these young kids coming out now, like Cameron Champ, Matt Wolf, the swing of the golf club so fast, the body has to be able to sustain that speed for... 30 years. Uh, can it do it? That's your job. <laughs> like you've yeah, got to, you, yeah. you know, if, they're, if they look after themselves 
and do it? Yeah, probably, but I, th I do believe we'll see the majority of golfers' longevity in the game yeah. reduce a wee bit. It's interesting. I mean, we again, we were saying uh, an example as a player I work with who is clocking 131 mile an hour club head speed, um, playing Euro Pro Challenge Tour, so it's not like he's competing at the top level. So mm -hmm. it's, just, it's more kind of evidence that there's a lot of players who are probably much longer and faster than mainstream knows because they're not the big names as of yet. The next generation coming through, 130 is probably going to be, but I wouldn't be surprised to see a 140 mile hour club speed in the next five or so years. I don't think it'd be long before you find tour players testing themselves against the long hitters in the long yeah. drive contest. I don't think it'd be long before we see a crossover there, whether it's the other way around, the long driver catcher comes and plays on the tour, or whether there's a player from the tour goes and has a go and competing with those guys. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's gonna, it's, it's only gonna go that way, I think, as, as more and more people understand the, the job that you do, creating the strength and the speed, um, and then we're, we're learning more about technique. We've got enough technology now to, to know exactly why, how speed is created. Um, there's more and more products on the market to help train speed. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it, it is gonna become, become that way. But one thing I will say, no matter how fast you are, you've still gotta be able to control it. Yeah. Um, there's no good being able to swing a seven iron at being able to swing a seven iron at 100 mile an hour if you don't do it every time. Mm -hmm. What's the point of being able to, you know, have five mile an hour club head speed when you don't need it? Yeah. You don't want to be between 95 and 100 with the seven iron. You want to be around 100 every single time. And that's the thing, you know, you've got to be careful. I think that some of these young lads coming out thinking, oh, I can get it to this, I can get it to that. No. Pick so something you're going to skill at. Yeah. Pick, pick a speed you're going to swing at and that's the distance you're going to hit the ball because um, distance control is still important. Not how far you can hit it, how far do you hit it. Yeah, I think that kind of, you know, the argument, you know, the worry, I guess, of the, the rule makers and, and the people who are kind of in control of the game as such are talking about these increases in distance and how the equipment, the ball, etc. But when we look at it from a logical perspective from what we just discussed there, you could probably argue actually the biggest increases are not coming from you know, the ball and the equipment aren't going to change. They're not going to advance any further from now. They can't. Mm -hmm. Yet, club head speed, so like we said, could be a 140 mile an hour. It could be a 350 carry in just stock conditions. At what point does that then, you can't you can't make a player, you can't make a rule where you can't train. So, where where's the game going in that respect? That's exactly where it is going. You know, unless, unless they... I suppose the only way they, they could control that is actually make golf courses shorter and tighter. Um, so that distance is an advantage. You could, you know, put a lake at 300 yards so everybody's short of it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the, the only way they can go with it. Un unless they do something like that, the, the game is going to get progressively longer. Yeah. But hasn't it always? Yeah. Hasn't the longest hitter always been it? the best player? Yeah. You know, you, you go back to Apparently, Hogan hit the ball a long way. Sneed hit the ball a long way in their day relative to the fields. Yes, yeah. um, Norman did. The, the only one really who didn't was Faldo. Um, but you look at Norman, Woosden, Seve, Nicholas. Then you come into Woods, Singh, Ells, Mickelson. They were all the longest yes. or within the, the top 10% yes. players mm -hmm. of, of, for distance. So distance has always been part of the game. Yeah, it has. You're absolutely right. I just think there's more people on board with it yeah. this year. This in this generation now, you know, there's your short hitter now is the real is the outlier. Whereas you, you know, your your John Daly's, the Tiger Woods's, they were the ones who were like, I'm gonna say the freaks. The you know the people who hit. Yeah. The, they were the, they were the outliers. Whereas nowadays it's the short hitter who was. Mm -hmm. Everyone's catching up. Everyone's catching up. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's, it is slightly, I mean, sat here having this conversation, you're thinking, well, where, you know, where does it go? I mean, you, like you say, you'd have to, course, course strategy or not, or course design does, it needs to change, doesn't it? Possibly, yeah. I mean, 
but then I still ask you, you know, what sort of scores still wins the US Open? What sort of scores? We're, we're not seeing a, a massive reduction in scoring. No. Um, I, I saw an interesting thing the other day. Someone was saying, oh, look at, you know, 59 was only broken so many times before on the PGA Tour, and now 58's been done. Well, actually, the two 58s have been done by the two shortest hitters. Yes. Yes. So, That's very true, yeah. It's, it's still possible for these short hitters to compete, you know? Everyone will find a way. Well, there's obviously the President's Cup and Royal Melbourne that everyone has been. Yeah, I mean, that's not a. Looks about. Yeah, it's, interestingly, you look at some of the courses where the. I'm going to say the worst score wins the tournament, but often the shorter ones. Look at Valderrama in Europe. Yes. Yeah. It's less than 7,000 yards. Very rarely the golfers get to 10 under par for the week. And then you get a course at 7,600 yards, and like Abu Dhabi or somewhere like yeah. that, and they go around there in 22 under par. So. I, I don't know. So but it is interesting. It's evolution, isn't it? That's that's just you know you've got to you can't control evolution. It just goes where it goes. It does yeah, it does. Um, and I think going back to something you touched on, we'll get off the topic of speed because I guess we're on it naturally. <laughs> um, you, Phil Mickelson. Yeah. Um, obviously, what is he now? Forty nine. He's 50? not far off, is he? He's, I think he's virtually on the ver uh, senior. Um, he increased his clubhead speed last off season. It was yeah. it was well documented. And then he's dropped out of the top fifty for the first time in however ridiculous amount of years, twenty plus years, isn't it, or something. Interesting. Now I'm not saying that's a connection, mm -hmm. but at the same time, could it be? You know, adding that type of speed is it there's obviously I've I've heard a golf coach refer to it as flash speed. It's probably not a very clear clear way of describing it but it's almost that you're just almost you increase speed without actually building it up over time so it's like that instant increases in speed it's, I guess it's like the same as we can use an example where if you were to do a sprint and then you do a resisted sprint and then you go back into a normal sprint it's so you're so yeah. powerful off the line because your brain's thinking it's yeah, going to have that resistance there that it's very hard for you to coordinate your limbs in that manner is that the same principle that we'll probably be seeing with a lot of players coming through? So that speed increase is not actually going to be much of an advantage in the short term. In the short term, possibly not. And again, I think it comes back to what I said, that he's been able to control the speed. Yeah. So Phil Mickelson may be able to achieve higher speeds, but can he do it consistently? So like I said before, it's okay being able to swim a seven mile at 100 mile an hour, but can you do it every time? Yeah. You know, if you drop off five, five mile an hour, that ball's going five miles before going about 13 yards shorter yeah. with a seven iron and that could be plugged in a bunker you know or mm -hmm. you then get the speed when it, and it goes too far so I, I think from a, a performance point of view it, it doesn't matter how far you can hit it although it is important to be able to hit it far it's how far do you hit it yeah. and knowing how far you hit it. Comes back to the basic principles of yeah and, and yeah. that hasn't changed throughout the years yeah distance control if you want to hit the ball well, there's no point in hitting the ball straight off the flag if it's the wrong distance. Mm -hmm. So possibly with Phil Mickelson there, you may find that, that he's created flash speed, so he's capable of more, and it comes along occasionally, or he's not quite sure how fast yeah. he does actually swim it. So his distance control may not be as good. Mm -hmm. I'm only guessing there. I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm not thinking out loud, why isn't it, do but that, but, um, but I think the point you're making there is actually... If you're going to increase speed, it needs to be done gradually over a period of time because if you do it straight away one day, the next day it might not be there again. Yes. I say the same when I'm making changes to a golf swing. Let's see, let's let's move it a degree a week rather than ten degrees in one in one day. Trying to overhaul everything. Yeah, way, just yeah. you know, so then you, you you get used to it as as you're doing it rather than it being very very different straight away. Mm -hmm. The reason I touch on that is though because of what we talked about with Dan. Yeah. I think I think I think sports psychology and you know I almost think it doesn't matter how you swing a golf club, whether you're strong or not, if you're not thinking properly you're not gonna do it. I you know, ninety-nine percent of the games played between the ears. Yeah. Yeah, fully on board with that. It's <laughs> the best the best golfers are the be are the are the best mentally, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods was yes. One of the longest, one of the best iron players, but never the best at anything. Yeah. But the best at doing it all together and getting around a golf course in a score 
that was the best score he could shoot on that day. Um, and I think that's what a lot of golfers could get better at. You know, there's you, you hear so many times when, you know, you come off a golf course, you, you listen to golfers talking and they tell you how many shots they've left out there. Well, do you know what? The best golfers don't leave many out there yeah. and that's because they're mentally strong. They get the best out of whatever they had on that day. And um, I think that the, the psychology side of it is huge, without a doubt. Do you think it's been... Do you think it's still, you know, like strength and conditioning still is quite young, but now it's it's probably been around more mainstream at least for the last sort of probably five or so years? I know you say definitely, yeah. Um, I think the generation, the younger generations are embracing it more. The older generations that didn't do it, that need to do it, have been brought up, been told the gym's bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember playing as a golfer. I went to the gym in the winter. Yeah, um, that's still a thing, though. Yeah, that is still a thing. You know, and then but then you hear a golfer's I mean I remember speaking to Danny Willett and he was saying he would go to the gym before he plays and I found that incredible. Yeah. Why would you go to the gym and, and um you know build muscle or you know affect your muscles before you go out for a game of golf? Yeah. But that is how, how it's done now. Um I suppose the the research, the knowledge people have more about the body works and everything like nowadays is, is better, so people understand that better. I mean, we were, I remember going playing for Yorkshire and there was a swimming pool, and we were told we weren't allowed to go swimming because it might affect our performance the next right. day. And you know, you're like, nowadays, you're like, wow. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because touching on that, you know, obviously training or, or doing a, some form of physical prep before playing is. Yeah, it's, it's strongly justified through research. It's something I do with all my players and try and build them up towards. But I've noticed with when that when golf's been in that transition, it still is now, where you've got what I would probably class more as a physiotherapist who is might have dealt with a player through they might have gone for back back and then they've gone, Well actually long term we want to get you doing a bit more physical work to try and reduce the risk of that reoccurring. They've then almost taken on that second role as S and C coach mm -hmm. and as a result I've noticed a lot of the training they provide is what I class as like fluff. It's almost, it's neither here nor there. Okay. So the player is almost thinking they're improving their body physically, where actually right. they might be getting the opposite effect of negatively impacting their performance, right, both mechanically, both from an injury perspective. Um, and I think you see a lot of players get injured because of their training. Mm. But it's not the training's fault as such, it's more the fact that how they're going about that training, yeah. how much they're... People think of heavy lifting as a, an injury risk. And the reality is it, it's really not if it's done properly, um, not just from a technical perspective, but more so from how you're building that up, how you're interlinking that with um, recovery, what time of day you're doing, etc., etc. But that's just, just good planning, first and foremost. And that's the difference between a real professional player, in my view, and someone who's a bit of an amateur playing on elite tours, you know what I mean? I think I think the point point there more than anything is if you are going to do anything, get the proper advice. Yes. If you're going to change your golf swing, don't do it on YouTube. Yeah. Go see a qualified professional who's going to help you change your golf swing properly. If you're going to go to the gym, don't just go to the gym and start lifting weights. Don't just go there and, and no disrespect to the guys, the personal trainers who are there at the at the gym. See someone who's really qualified in the area you want to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to do it for your golf, go see someone who, who is qualified within the golf industry to help you with your golf. Um, just looking on YouTube and thinking, oh, I'm going to go do some X. Oh, man, do you know what? I'm going to do some press ups. Yeah, yeah. No, Why? If you're gonna, yeah, yeah. Don't if you if you're not going to do it properly, don't bother. Yeah. Stay, stay, stay as, you are. Of stay as yeah. you are and accept this is the level I'm at, this is the golfer I'm at, this is what I can do and I'm going to enjoy this for it. If you want to improve, get the proper advice. Mm -hmm. in, any, in, any yeah, in, any, in anything. And I think that's something I've been thinking about for quite a long period of time actually and I've never really got, I'm not looking for a particular answer, but I've never really got a very good answer from people because I think it's quite a hard thing to visualise for a lot of um, people in, in golf really is I can almost see at some point in the future, and, that, and there are coaches out there almost now who are, are touching on this, where you've obviously got myself, the physical specialist, you've got yourself what we'll call the technical specialist, and then you'll have a psychological, uh, and then you'll probably even have a performance coach who tries to bring all that together, etc. 
do you see or could you see an individual doing all of that to a good enough level to even with it like I'm not talking saying you know you need to be a top end psychologist who's, who's fully qualified PhD or something like that but enough of psychology interventions to be able to help that player to help their swing then maybe impact them physically whether that's just basic training principles do you think that's too much for one person or do you think that's achievable I think it's too much for one person yeah personally um, I think from my point of view if I was to delve into all those areas I'd need more hours in my day to, to make that work and I think from a business perspective it's not good I think you're better off specialising yeah. in you know what if you want to change your golf swing come and see me if you want to get stronger go see yourself if you want to, you know, get mentally better, go see a psychologist. If, if having all that, don't don't get me wrong. I personally think it's it's better for me to have a knowledge, but I would never say to somebody, "Oh, I can see your shoulders badly, mm -hmm. works badly. Here's some exercises to go do." I wouldn't think to myself, "I would, I'd be, I'd be liable," you know. Yes. Yeah. To do that, if I was to advise somebody to do it, so I would tell someone to go research themselves or go see a specialist in that area i think it if you look at the best players they have a team yes. around them um you know they've got like you say the performance coach the swing coach the short game coach the putting coach the i don't know shoe cleaner whatever it is <laughs> that they've got going on around them, the strength and conditioning coach they've got a team of people around them now um whereas 25 years ago it was literally the swing coach yeah and the swing coach had to you know, do all the things. So that's maybe where everything is changing because other people are seeing areas of the game that can that can help people improve and, and I suppose are seeing a, a niche in the market for mm -hmm. themselves to get in there and and do it. And it's we can see it's improving golfers. It's definitely improving it is, golfers. Yeah. It's just a case of the you know the average golfer needs to get on board a little bit more um, with all these areas if they want to improve. So they want to improve, yeah, and that's the big one, isn't it? Is there's more than one way of improving, and I guess typically is the first area people look to is probably just technique. Absolutely, yeah. And to be honest with you, I'm a technical coach. I also, I also think I'm a performance coach as well as a technical coach. I don't think I'm a purely swing coach, although I do have a quite good knowledge of technique. Um, that's where people look. Don't they? they have a bad round. The first thing they do is fill the swing. Well, you might have played bad because you got out of the wrong side of bed that morning. Mm. You know, you might be, you might have a bit of a cold. Anything, all yeah. these things come into play. Bad, so it's yeah. you've got to be very, very careful in, in terms of. I, I think, to be honest with you, keeping stats is important and seeing where you are in terms of your performance over a period of time, not just one day, over a period of time. What's happening with my performance and where can I make gains? If it's distance, well. See your swing coach through your strength and conditioning coach. If it's the fact that you lose energy through the round, see maybe your strength and conditioning coach and your nutritionist. Yeah. If it's a case of you get on a really tough hole and fall apart, we'll see your psychologist. Mm -hmm. But you don't if you don't have that information available to actually know where it's going wrong. Correct. Yeah. You don't know where to start. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think touching on that kind of question of could an individual do, try and do everything is the reason I kind of could see someone potentially going down that route is because I feel like you're starting to see snippets of it now. I know coaches who um, are very different to a strength condition coach, although not fully understood in the industry, but TPI certified, yeah. who are technical coaches who then will go and they will probably, they'll do the assessment, they'll even try and prescribe exercise, which I think is, is risky. At best, <laughs> I think. I think um, for, for me, that having an, I'm not TPI qualified, but I have studied it. I've not yeah. done my qualification. I think more than anything, from a technical coach's point of view, that should only be to see what workaround you have to do. Do you have a physical limitation when you hit? Well, yes, you do. Right, we need to do this with your golf swing to be able to make sure you can hit a golf. Ball. Yeah. Unless you are going to go see somebody to sort that physical limitation. Yeah. yeah. If they say no, they're not. Right. This is how we have to swing a golf. Correct. Right, yeah. And it's not a question from some from my point of view of, of prescribing exercising to somebody to I think you've hit the nail on the head there and that's that's you know you sometimes I'll ask a question from 
what I'm seeing from different coaches, online, social media, research, and you've answered the question that I think is, the, is absolutely correct. You know, like you shouldn't be, you should be using that information to guide you technically, but then depending on what that individual wants is where that, whereas I think there's a very, there's a borderline where a lot of coaches now are going too far. Mm. What do you want? Or we're assessing you, or maybe I'll try and intervene physically. Um, and that's where I think something like golf strength conditioning, even technical coaching, even the players start being mis being confused really. And that's that's a dangerous road to go down, isn't it? I think as a as a golf swing coach, you you've got to be careful because I would say the golf swing coach is usually the first port of call mm -hmm. for poor performance. To go see the coach. And then it's for the coach to advise what areas the, the, the need to improve and provide information of where to get where to go and do it. So if somebody who comes along for me has a physical limitation, wants to get rid of the limitation, I, I put them in touch with you straight away and, and go see Sam and get yourself sorted out here. Um, if they didn't want to do that, then we'd have to do a workaround in terms of the technique. It's, it's more a case of like, <clears throat> yeah, you're almost at the top of the umbrella as a, as a swing coach, yeah, I'd say. Definitely, I agree. Um, not that you're the most important, but you're the first port of call. It's the first, exactly, yeah. Golfers go see the swing coach. Of the coach and then you have to provide the answers and for me the answers aren't always with me yes uh, it's a great it's a great answer I don't, know, I don't know, know enough about I know snippets mm -hmm. about things but I don't know enough about I, I haven't got half the knowledge you've got mm -hmm. you know in, on strength and conditioning um, so it's like I say it's important to, for the coach to send the people in the yeah. right direction it's good it's, and it's that's interesting to hear from a different perspective and I think that's just kind of justifies or proves that golf is still in big transition in that regard with more and more people, like you say, more niches, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, more people who are specialists in different areas that not a golf coach can't, to the next level, they can you know, give information on or certainly guide on, but they can't intervene onto it. And um, well, you players are getting more and more familiar yeah, with that, aren't they now? You look at Francesco Molinari, we've seen a big improvement in Francesco Molinari. Um, and Dennis Pugh has been his long-term coach for a long time. They decided he needed distance. Mm -hmm. So Dennis Pugh sought out um, Lee Cox. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> got some information from Lee Cox on how they can help improve distance. I, I would imagine there's some strength and conditioning going in there as well. I can't see that, that there hasn't been. But they also um, highlighted his short game and his putting as a weakness. Yeah. So instead of Dennis going down the route of saying, well, let's have a look at your putting, let's have a look at your short game, they sought the help of James Ridyard and, and Phil Kenny. Brilliant, yeah. So Malinari built a team around him of specialists within areas. That freed Dennis up then to not have to, you know, having sleepless nights worrying about every aspect of a I guess that shows how open minded and actually how knowledgeable someone like Dennis Pugh actually is yeah. to be able to go, you know I don't know enough about yeah. that, so let's so let's see if someone who does. And he's I guess still, you know, Molinari's go to man yeah. and most respected person and sound board, but First and foremost, he's not the exactly. be it all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is genius, really, because I guess a lot of coaches, I'm, I'm self guilty of it sometimes, where you sometimes want to do it all. Well, we're precious, help, we're, we're, precious we? we're precious over our clients, and I've always tried to have the attitude of I don't own the client. I'm employed by the mm -hmm. client. Mm -hmm. um, where they go is up to them. All I can do is provide as best information as I see fit for them to get better. They don't have to take the information, but. I, you know, we, we can be quite precious over our over our clients. You know, there's nothing wrong with if you think someone else can improve your golfer better than you can. As say, why don't you go and correct? Have a yeah, so and so. Yeah, it. that's a really good point and a good place to finish on. I think. Mm. Um, well, I think what I kind of taken from that is it shows me from someone like myself who's kind of the physical side. It shows that golf really is moving forward. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't believe it wasn't, but there's always there's always aspects where you see, you know, you see it in any industry, but you see kind of coaching online, you see comments and you think, is it really moving forward? I thought we kind of moved past that sort of things. Like you see it in all everything, don't you? But, yeah, definitely. But it certainly is and people like yourself who are someone I regard is that kind of at the forefront of that type of coaching, who's moving the, the industry forward from an amateur level, we've moved all the way up to pros. Um and I can only see that sort of continuing. So. Definitely, definitely. I mean, it, it's just 
getting more knowledge out there, getting more information out for people so that are, they're aware that the physical side of the game is important. Yeah. The yeah. body is important. Definitely. Brilliant. Right. Thank you, Ben. Pleasure.